We turn now to the gospel according to John, the 20th chapter. I invite you to hear God's word to your life. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to Thomas, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that through believing, you may have life in his name. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, help us to experience your peace in this place. And when we leave this place this morning, help us to experience your peace in every part of our lives as we look to you to be the Lord of our lives. Christ's name we pray. Amen. After Easter Sunday, expectations may return to something like business as usual, but nothing could be further from the truth. We are in Easter season, which means there are 50 days, seven weeks, devoted to living into the reality of the resurrection. And a long-standing tradition in the church is to look at the disciple named Thomas on one of the Sundays following Easter, a story that shows us that it's not very easy to live into the reality of Easter. You know Thomas's nickname, Doubting Thomas, Doubter. Personally, I think this nickname is somewhat ridiculous, and I will tell you why. Because... Every time we put labels on people, it paints a somewhat incomplete picture. It doesn't tell the whole story of who they are. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Thomas on the pages of the New Testament. And here, he confesses this one doubt. And then we label him Doubting Thomas. And each Easter, like clockwork, we kick him around for a while as kind of the stereotypical skeptic. Some of us may even shake our heads at Thomas as though doubt were the opposite of faith. Let's get something out of the way before we move on. We all have doubts. Every day of our lives are filled with doubts. Every day. We doubt ourselves and we doubt the people and the world around us. We doubt if we'll wake up in the morning. We doubt if we'll be able to get out of bed We doubt our bodies, we doubt our minds, we doubt our spouses, we doubt our children, we doubt our pastors, we doubt our neighbors, 
We doubt our bosses. We doubt our bosses if they think that we're, that we're doing a good job. We doubt if we're the right person for the job. We doubt if the work we do makes any difference. We doubt the president. We doubt politicians, especially if they're on the other side. We doubt if people will come through for us. We doubt if we'll ever be as good as that person. We doubt if we'll pass the class. We doubt if we'll be able to lose those 10 pounds. We doubt if the pants or the dress will ever fit again. We doubt the food we eat. We doubt if the book will be good or if the movie will be as good as the book. We doubt if we'll be able to pay the bills. We doubt if we'll, if we'll get any kind of tax refund this year or if we'll have to pay more to the government. We doubt if anyone notices us. We doubt whether we'll meet people's expectations. We doubt if the relationship will work. We doubt what the future will look like. We doubt if we'll be able to make it to the gym this week. We doubt if we'll, if we'll be able to ski down that double black diamond in one piece and live to tell about it. We doubt if our teams are going to win. We doubt if we're going to get what we really need. My goodness, we doubt. If you don't doubt, you're simply not human. And I haven't even mentioned anything related to our faith that we doubt. I love what Frederick Buechner says about doubt. A God who leaves no room for doubt leaves no room for me. He also says, whether your faith is that there is a God or that there is not a God, if you don't have any doubts, you are either kidding yourself or asleep. Doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it awake and moving. So can we please give Thomas a break? I'm inclined to believe that most of us actually find a real sense of validation in Thomas. I don't believe John is trying to make an example of Thomas here by painting him to be either faithless or a step behind the other disciples. John seems to be painting a picture of resurrection faith. It can be critical. It can be messy. It can require work and effort. And more importantly, this story shows us how Jesus meets us in the midst of all of that. I believe doubts kind of go with the turf of believing. They can cause us to be reflective about our faith, to examine our faith. They can propel us, which is a major mark of our tradition and denomination, to use our brains, to think for ourselves. We also know that doubt can crowd out hope. It can move us to that edge of faith that has forgotten how to believe. Of all the characters Jesus meets in the post-resurrection world, none perhaps has left a stronger mark than Thomas. He may be the skeptic that hides inside every believer, the questioner in us that, that resists easy answers to hard questions of faith, who always wants to know a little more, who always needs a little more proof. I like people who see things for what they are and say it how it is. People who don't speak with any hidden layers or require any kind of interpretation. There's something called, you may have heard of it, but there's something called Southern speak, which I was surrounded with for several years living in the South. Now, Southern speak, I came to soon realize, is pretty much the opposite of being blunt. A common southern speak phrase is, bless her heart, or bless his heart. And I realized that this phrase was often, usually, a preface used before someone launched into speaking ill of another person. <laughs> now, it, is, it was done, it is done, of course, in a somewhat tactful way. And I'll be honest and say, I don't really understand or like southern speak. I like to hear it how it is. I like to say it how it is. I don't want to go through the hard work of translation. And I think this is why my appreciation for Thomas continues to grow. Thomas called a spade a spade. He said it like he saw it. If he couldn't understand or believe something, he was direct with his, co with his, with his questions and comments. In the first three Gospels, we are told nothing about Thomas. 
It is in the Gospel of John that he emerges as a distinct personality, a personality that's kind of an all or nothing. He tells it like it is, and he sees things for what they are. You remember the story when Lazarus was terribly ill and then died. Jesus had delayed coming to Bethany on the outskirts of Jerusalem. And at that moment, all the disciples might have well refused to follow Jesus because they were all feeling that to go back to Jerusalem was to be going back to their death. So they were hanging back. And just then, Thomas, Thomas, offered an earnest proposal that revealed a very important aspect of his character. Thomas said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas said that. Doubting Thomas said that. Another glimpse of Thomas is at the Lord's Supper. Everyone's stomach was churning, upset by the sour words Jesus doled out to them for them to digest. Words like, one of you will betray me. Where I go, you cannot come. I go to prepare a place for you. Only Thomas had the courage to acknowledge that he didn't understand and ask the question, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus replied, I am the way and the truth and the life. How about honest Thomas instead of doubting Thomas? And while we certainly resonate with him, many of us resonate with him, we do find in this story, in John's story, ultimately an answer that does not concern who Thomas is, but concerns who Jesus is and how we encounter the risen Lord. It's a story about God coming to us, wherever we might be, and then not letting us stay there. Up until the story, faith, comes in the face of Jesus' physical presence. And here in the word to Thomas, Jesus sets it up for the experience of God to not be based solely on sight. Decades after these words were written, the last disciple died. And never again on earth would physical eyes or noses or tongues certify the presence of Jesus. The one direct call for verification in this text came through hearing. Thomas gets to be the one to whom it is announced first that from now on, hearing would be the way. Notice something with me. Jesus spoke an invitation to touch and see, but we are not told whether Thomas ever did touch. Jesus challenges and invites Thomas to to not doubt, but believe. And instead of examining wounds, Thomas responds with one of the strongest greatest confessions recorded in the entire New Testament. My Lord and my God. The one absolutely unequivocal statement in the whole gospel came from a doubter. It's also worth noting that one week after the disciples had been visited by the risen Christ and received his Holy Spirit, they have once again put themselves behind closed doors. Thomas is actually one step ahead of the other disciples. He only wants to receive what they have already received. And it seems, though, that they have not yet gone out to share, gone out to forgive, gone out to share the good news of salvation, to live with the bigger purpose in their lives. And here is where the heart of the story lies, my friends. It is that Jesus comes to them and meets them where they are. They didn't warrant a second visit but he appears again to these scared and confused disciples. Even though they didn't go out and find him, the risen Christ found them. And this story stands as a promise to us as well that we too will experience Jesus coming to us, meeting us wherever we are in whatever needs we have. And where we are sometimes in our faith is on the inside of that door, in that room, scared and nervous and full of doubt. This is the shared space where Jesus meets us, calling our names and calming our fears. 
The peace that Jesus announces, though, does not allow any of his disciples to remain there. Jesus commissions them to step outside the door. Numbers don't lie. A report came out last year on global, global religious identity, showing that while Christians and Muslims make up t- the two largest groups, those with no religious affiliation, including atheists and agnostics, are now the third largest religious group in the world. 16%, or about 1.1 billion people of the world's population, say they have no religious affiliation or say they do not believe in God. Some may see this as kind of a glass half full situation. That wow, 84% of the world claims some kind of belief system. But I'm afraid the real question is whether or not the non-religious are outpacing the religious when it comes to growth. These statistics show that there are still words to share. There are stories to tell. There are lives waiting to be changed. There are lives waiting to discover. And are we leaving the closed doors of safety to face this despairing world and give it hope and fullness that we experience in Christ? Today we come to church with the joyful sounds of Easter still resonating in our ears, in our hearts, in our minds. We have been to the empty tomb. We have seen, we have heard the glad news of resurrection. And now it is time for the church to get out from behind closed doors and send a message back to the world. And what should that message be? May I suggest that it is a message with nowhere to be found in it, any kind of judgment or closed-mindedness, for it is a message of grace. God always has the last word, and it is always a word of grace. It is a message of forgiveness and joy, because all are welcome. All are welcome. And that one day, one day, all will be well.